those sedimentary levels are older than the ones on top, which is pretty obvious. And then a couple different ways to date. You have relative dating, which is a, a sequence of species. So the ones on the bottom are older than the ones on top. That's just relative. Absolute is using like carbon dating, radioactive dating to kind of get an exact date. So those are the two different ones there that you would be familiar with. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, kind of go back to biogeography, kind of looking at uh, past species. We talked about Pangaea a little bit a while ago, about 250 million years ago. Pangaea was everything was kind of thrown together down here. Um, you had this huge Permian e extinction at this time where a lot of the species disappeared and then new ones formed in new land. And then you had a lot of geographic isolation about 180 million years ago when everything started to uh, separate in the continents. That's why Africa and South American uh, reptiles look very similar. They were all kind of in the same area. There you go. Okay. Um, some mass extinctions that popped up. We talked about the Permian. You know, 90% of the marine uh, animals were disappeared at that time. And then you, you all know about the, you know, the Cretaceous one 65 million years ago where the dinosaurs died. And about 50% of the marine species the idea was it was a comet that did it, but they're still looking at all those different things. I have some other ideas of why the dinosaurs uh, became extinct, I'll show you here in a second. Um, here's like all the different uh, mass extinctions that kind of happened. You can kind of see the relationship. I just kind of, I just like the graph. I just kind of threw it on. I won't go over, you can look at it. I just like graphs. I just like data, so that's one of my things, I don't know why. So, that's that, but my reason for the, the dinosaurs to become extinct is pretty much, I don't know that yet, man. It's the real reason why they became extinct. I'm sorry. They look like dragons. They look like, yeah. Smoking behind the building. Okay, moving on. Uh, yeah. Okay. Now when we look at taxonomy, kind of how we name species, and that kind of goes with evolutionary classification. The first one was the Linnaean system. It's still kind of used today. It's where each species has uh, two names, like humans, Homo sapiens, uh, fruit flies, Drosophila melanogaster, you know, those type of things, genus of species. I always bring up fruit flies because that's my research that I do. I raise fruit flies. Uh, okay, and so then this is kind of how you do the phylogenetics. And so you're looking at how you break down everything is related. Starting with the domain. Most people learn kingdom as the top system, but that's been changed now to the domain system. There are three domains now. You have the eukarya, which are, you know, the eukaryotes. You have the archae bacteria, which are the ancient bacteria. And you have the eubacteria, which are the true bacteria, which I'll show you here in a second. Then you just move through King to find class, family, or genus, species. And so there's different ways. I don't know if you're up to know that, but that's kind of the breakdown. King Philip came over from Germany swimming. You know, that's one easy way to remember. So what's the, was it phylum or phylum? Yeah, phylum. That's the one that they keep talking about here. Or it's mentioned in the animal. Yeah. So you look yeah. at phyla. And so when you look at king, like the animal kingdom, mm -hmm. you break down into the different phyla. So you have a lot of the invertebrate phyla, you have like um, the crustaceans, you have the vertebrates, you have the uh, peripherans, which are sponges, you have the nidarians, which are corals and jellies. And so that breaks down all the animals at a very broad level. And then you can just move yourself down through the, the classification system. So like for a panther, you got the chordates, it's a mammal, it's a carnivore, it's part of the cat family, and its genus is Panthera and its species is parts. And so that's kind of how everything is broken down. Well, the way Linnaeus did it was based on physical trait. That's all he looked at is what they looked like and that's how he classified. But what we've done now is we've actually looked at molecular and cellular biology and kind of how they're related that way. And so we've changed a lot of the classification systems. Okay, so that's phylogenetics. Um, other ways you can create something called a phylogenetic tree. I'm sure there, these will pop up to be able to see relationships. 
um, uh, plague will pop up. That's kind of a branch. And so you can kind of see different branches within, you know, the different uh, phylogenetics. And so there's different ways in which we can look at it. Uh, the one over here is what we'll call monophyletic, which is one single ancestor has given rise to a wide variety of organisms. Mono meaning one, one phylum, versus paraphyletic, where you have just a single branch. Which one is anagenesis? Which one is cladogenesis? See if you can remember. Sure. Which one's an this one would be anagenesis because it goes to a single oh. form change. This would be cladogenesis because you have a single form that can branch from there. Okay. And then paraphyletic where you have species are not related. Um, another way to create a cladogram is by looking at homology and analogy, kind of how things are similar, related, what they look like, and that way you can kind of classify them together, which I'll do one here for you. So to create a cladogram, what you can do here is you can look at different characteristics of an organism. So here you hair, amniotic egg, jaws, backbone. And you want to see the relationship between like the leopard and you know a turtle in hair. There's no relationship, obviously. And so what this does is it just shows how everything is closely related to each other. And then you can create a nice little branching family tree from that. And so from here you can kind of tell the first one that very everybody has, you know, everything has a vertebral column except for the lancelets. That's an invertebrate, and so they branch this way. Then the next thing you look at are jaws. Lampreys are jawless fish. Everything else has a jaw, so you're branching this way. So everything that is closer, higher up in the cladogram, they're more closely related. The further away they are, the less likely they're related to each other based on these characteristics. So that's kind of how a cladogram is put together. Uh, what else do I got? Okay, last thing. Um, just a quick, on the thing on the outline, I said a brief history of time, and so I just did a quick overview of what's kind of happened in the past 4.6 billion years, um, or actually 12 billion, I threw the solar system in there, but Earth life came about, about 3.5 billion to 4 billion years ago or so, give or take a, a million years. Uh, prokaryotes were the first ones that popped up.